Sherry, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. So I am super excited to talk about um, your keynote that you've done recently, Humanizing Blockchain. I love the topic of that. And, um, and I want to jump into that because that to me is kind of exactly what we're all about here at the New Trust Economy, that we're really talking about how do we get more women in it? How do we get more diversity in it? How do we humanize what is this technology so that we can make it a, you know, it can be untrustworthy or trustworthy, but we can still make it work for us as humans, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So how'd you get started in blockchain? Let's start there. Um, so I've actually been in technology for years, uh, not specifically blockchain, but I've been in uh, technology for probably almost 20 years. And uh, so it's been a long time. And um, I actually was a former programmer. And then I got more into, you know, leading tech teams, <coughs> excuse me, and ultimately getting more into the branding communications and marketing side. So I've always, isn't that the case though, that like yes. so much of technology needs to be like marketed and branded and like, and it, it helps to have a technology background to understand that and to, but to figure out how to message that. Absolutely. Because I mean, as you know, um, technology is, is extremely complex, number one. And number two, it's overwhelming to most people. Right. So, um, so it does help to have that background and not necessarily that you need to know the ins and outs of what a developer is doing all day, every day, or how it actually works on an intricate level. Um, but it does help you, like you said, to actually explain it to an audience that um, is not familiar, does not speak, you know, the technical language on a day to day basis. And Honestly, what I've found is even when you're speaking with high level executives, maybe at the CTO level where they obviously have that level of background, I've learned that even with them, their initial conversations with you, their initial introduction to you, they don't want somebody coming at them with all of this te technology knowledge because the truth is, they want to really understand, do you know how to explain it to, to the everyday person? Do you understand? So they want the basics first. They want the yes. vision first. <laughs> Absolutely. Because, you know, it's really easy to kind of talk and make things really, really complex, especially if you're nervous or if you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I've heard that many a time too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, it actually really, it's, it's funny because I've, I think I've learned over the years that that's one of my biggest skills is the ability to research and learn and ask the right questions and then to internalize it and then put myself in the shoes of somebody that doesn't understand it or is short on time and relay it in a way where they can easily not just grasp what uh, this complex issue, but walk away remembering, right, what they, what they got out of the message and what your mission is in a way that it impacts them to then take action. Mm, and that in that. itself is a skill as, in, in its own. <laughs> it is seriously a skill. It's actually a much missed skill in most places. And so I pride myself on the ability to talk. I call it talking different languages. Like I can yeah. talk to the engineering team and I can talk to a design team. So I can talk art creative and I can talk tech and then I can talk finance and then I can talk legal. And so being able to have those communication skills and being able to distill it into what is most important to the audience that's listening. I mean, that's kind of the key to really getting funded, to getting your technology adopted, to getting buy-in throughout a, a, an organization. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. And, you know, an area that I'm really, really uh, seeing a huge need for it is after the funding, after, um, you know, all of that excitement has kind of worn down. 
and now you're 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 doing the long term stretch, <laughs> right? You know, it's so so important. You know, this is where I think a lot of companies fall apart. A lot of startups yeah. fall apart. You're so right there. It's that it's after this sort of hype of oh, I got funding. There's a lot of hype around the technology, perhaps. So you're into that. I call it the application cycle. And if you're not applying it, if you're not showing proof, if you're not showing case studies, if you're not at that stage of being able to show some kind of demonstrable return on investment, then you've got to be able to explain it in a very different way. Why, why not, yeah. what's next, what we need. And that's really where a lot of deals completely fall apart and companies fall through. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think for me, one of the most devastating um, aspects of that like you're saying that this is this is the critical phase where most of them fall apart i think what's so devastating for me is seeing um the pushback at actually understanding this so for those of us that have been in this field for a while and do have that ability to communicate ability to engage um whether it's your potential clients your community um the people that are going to keep you around long term. Yeah. I think if you don't have that uh, that foresight, that experience, that um, that wisdom uh, for sustainability, and you're working with people that are only seeing what's right in front of them, it, it's to me it feels like you're watching a train crash. <laughs> yes, I, I mean, I, I, don't, I agree. I don't <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to be dramatic, but that's what it feels like to me. And so sometimes it feels like a slow motion train yeah. crash. Like <laughs> this is what happened to me when I was, and I use this analogy a lot of times. It's like, so I want, I, I was through the hype cycle and other parts of the 3D print sort of boom and then bust. And so when you watch that, I was watching these companies going, they're not going to make it. There's no way they're going to make it. And I was, you know, writing about them in my column and, you know, it's just, I was just watching that going, it's not going to happen for them. They don't get it. Right. They aren't communicating with their users. They're following just, you know, the, sometimes they follow the super users and that leaves out so much of the, uh, the next level of adoption. Yes. And so that's where a lot of it falls apart. You're so right. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, and, and it's amazing because just like you, yeah, you're, you're seeing like the same language. They're like, no, we're just focused on these people. And you're like, no, <laughs> because, no, that's not what's next. <laughs> right. And you know, yeah. what's really funny is that it actually doesn't even matter whether the technology is blockchain or AI or anything. It's the same, what I call like business principles. Yeah. of how to take your company from startup to growth. It's the same, I call it, it's the same product launch principles. And that's yes, where it's like, launch. whether it's a, uh, you know, whether it's a software product or it's a blockchain product or it's a, yeah. you know, or it's a non-tech product, the process yes. is exactly the same. The service launches are exactly the same because they follow consumer principles. And yes. if you, you know, and whether it's business to business consumers or, or our physical, like, you know, retail consumer, there's a little bit of difference in how it gets to market, but not much difference in how people buy or how they think or how they process or how they adopt technology. It's exactly the same. Absolutely. And it's funny because um, in, so this, this talk that I give, Humanizing Blockchain, it's actually called Humanizing Blockchain, How to Build Trust in a Trustless System. Oh, you are perfect for this show. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I, I'm so passionate about this topic. So I, I'm loving this right now. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, the thing is, we want these companies to survive. And, and I think a lot of times what happens is your startup is your baby. Your product is your baby, right? Right. And you know that there's a certain level of independence, resilience, uh, not listening to the naysayers, not listening to outside opinion. There's a certain level of that, obviously, to, to get to success, right? But there's also this fine line of, are you doing what is necessary to ultimately, because the truth is, 
you can have a, a, a business, I guess, but technically you need to be generating revenue. And if it has you, to be a sustainable business, right? <laughs> right. Sustainable, right? Keyword here. So if you need to get people to buy, um, you know, there's, there's a, there's a very simplified way that I like to describe uh, the buying process. And that is very simplified. Is that I've learned that people tend to buy what they want versus what they need. And I'll explain further. In a really, really simplified version, um, I could package myself up as a branding thought leader or coach. And I could share what I truly feel that most people need to become a thought leader or to influence, you know, people by the masses. And that is, you really just need confidence because most people have everything they need to go out, package themselves up, market some type of service or product and make money, right? To deliver that exchange and get money in return. The reason most of us don't do this is because we actually don't believe in ourselves enough and we don't have that confidence internally. And then we don't have that confidence to actually communicate that level of assurance out to the audience um, to get them to buy. And so what I learned, and I've actually tested this, I've learned that when I would market a product that was called branding or thought leadership or build a large community, um, people were all over that. But if I marketed a much cheaper, like pennies, product that was called confidence, which is really what they need, <laughs> it barely sold. But the more expensive product that was titled what they want, which is they want the brand, they want the thought leadership, they want people to pay attention because they have a marketing uh, or a message to relay, they would rather spend thousands on that then the same product called confidence, which was maybe $97. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I so am with you there. It's, it, you know, uh, it, it's just one of these things where um, I have the same problem with the inventor community. So, and I think it is that they hide behind the product. They hide behind the technology. They hide behind the details of these things and they get completely caught up in that, that they can no longer communicate the vision and all of that. And it really is that they are not confident in all the things they don't know, like how to get to market and how to do all of these things. So they then go for the one thing that they know is a validation of what, they, what they've invented, which is the patent. And it's the last thing they actually need. Right. And so, um, you know, so that is really the same kind of thing that you're talking about is it's, you know, they'll spend tens of thousands of dollars on getting a patent. And the reality is, is that they really need to be spending that on marketing. Like, <laughs> I wish I could say you could spend it on the product, but you can't, you got to spend yeah. it on the marketing nowadays or building your community or getting that messaging right. And, and then get the product later. But it's yeah. okay. So, you know, I want to touch on a little bit about how you found blockchain and, 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 you know, so you're immersed in this technology world. World and you know, and you heard about this blockchain thing. Like, how did you decide? Wow, there's really something here. Um, so I think you know, I had been out of technology for uh, a couple of years, really focusing on um, uh, doing branding. You know, in the more more recent uh, world, and really helping to create more leaders. And a friend of mine um, had, you know, started writing articles on it. And I finally was like, okay, you know, he's getting really passionate about it. Um, but I don't know if this is for me. What is it's it? It's like, and what Kool-Aid did he drink? Yeah. <laughs> that's what my husband always asks me when I come home and I'm like, oh my gosh, you got to hear about this AI thing or this black chain thing. He's right. like, what did you drink? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and I think a lot, most of those articles were more geared towards writing about crypto, you know, cryptocurrencies. 
So I don't know it, that in itself, uh, I thought the principle was great, but I, I had a lot of voices in my said, head saying, how is that going to work? You know, how's the government ever going to let that work? So I was, I, I, it wasn't enough, I think, to pull me over to, yeah. the, to the blockchain world. And when I finally just sat down and asked my friend a couple of questions, you know, he really shared with me that the star of all of this is the technology behind it. And that's when he started, you know, sharing with me a little bit more about uh, blockchain as a technology. And I, I don't know, it was something to do with, I think, my, my past experience in technology. You know, I loved technology. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't mean uh, uh, to, to get away from it, but life circumstances- it just happened. <laughs> yeah, it happened pulled me in a new direction. And so for me, this was like, oh my God, I love technology. Like, let me just learn more because my friend was interested. And, you know, it would give us something to talk about. So um, I started learning even more and really diving in and ultimately spending till like 4 a.m. every single night, obsessed, <laughs> literally obsessed learning about it. And I think what really, really got me excited was once I started learning about the benefits um, and how it could impact major industries like healthcare, supply chain, um, you know, uh, other countries that didn't have access to banking. You know, that to me really spoke to my own core values and my own mission to impact humanity in the world. And, you know, that's what really drew me in. And ever since then, I, I've been, like I said, obsessed. Um, but it was really through, through that initial um, introduction that I, I ended up, you know, um, very quickly growing a name for myself in the industry. And then I started working for directly for a blockchain startup. And so tell me a little bit about that part of it. I, my path is really similar to yours in, in exploring it. And the thing that I like is when I start to see really good application of things, I go, oh, this is solving a problem. And so yeah. when, you know, we see a lot of problems and this is something that I think is, is very characteristic of, I'm going to say the disenfranchised, the sort of out of the loop. There's a lot of women who see these things and go, wow, why hasn't somebody done this yet? This is a problem I've been having for a long time. We're out there searching for things and we don't see that application happening right away. So yeah. how, how did you get involved with the startup? Did you see an application idea and thought this has to work? Yeah, well, it's funny because this, this same friend Actually, I, I found out as I was studying behind the scenes, I just ended up finding out that he was in the background building out uh, an application for specifically supply chain, mm. uh, freight and logistics. And, um, and I was like, hold up, you know, <laughs> what is all this about? And tell me more. And, you know, I didn't know anything about supply chain. And uh, I you know, know but, too much. Right. Which is why I know that this is like a, it's like a disaster area you're going exactly. into. So I know where you're going there. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I knew nothing. And once I started understanding, I learned how much of an impact supply chain has on my life, uh, my family's life, my friends, um, you know, our jobs. Uh, the day-to-day -day things and items and services that we rely on unconsciously every single day, the clothes we wear. The I, food we eat. So right the, now we're in a romaine crisis, yes, right? Across exactly. the country, right? And so yes. people are like, I don't understand. Why do they not? Why did it take them two weeks to figure out where the right. romaine was coming from? Yes. Well, this is a supply chain tracking problem. It's just Absolutely. not that simple. And we Absolutely. don't have a system. In most, in most places, and it's very, very difficult. Um, Walmart is doing something about it, but it, it is not a standard. There is no standardized method for supply chain. And so depending on the size of the company, they have a process, 
but it's usually proprietary to them. Yes, absolutely. And, and therein lies the problem is that you've got a global supply chain system that is an entire ecosystem of ecosystems right <laughs> and networks and processes so all wrapped up into this mega you know uh system we call supply chain but it's really made up of a series of endless value chains and supply chains and processes and networks and and goods and and resources all literally moving the entire global economy every minute of every day. And this is what I think people need to realize and, and what I know you, you know already is that there's no consumer in that process, right? Because it's like I'm supplying, I'm just handling the trucking from this distance to that distance, whether it's over land, um, I'm handling the shipping. So whatever those companies are, they have their own value chain. That's what you mentioned. And so they have their own profitability matrix and their own, and then the person on the other side is their consumer as far as they're concerned. So if shipping costs too much, then you're not going to get the, you're not going to get the job and it's going to go to another shipping company. Right. And so it's like, it's all built on that. It's not built on at all what matters to the consumer or how the consumer is going to receive this product or what they care about in the end, of, at the end of the day. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that in itself is, is where, uh, so much of the the complexities and how do we fix this because everyone's really just focused <laughs> on on their own uh you know like you said on their their own their own system right and and, it, and it's and this has gotten to be the point of where i think you know you've gone with your with your talk is that it creates a distrust in the whole process yeah. so we don't trust walmart we don't trust the shipping companies we don't trust you know our freight forwarders we don't trust anyone in that process no yeah. matter what part of the chain we're in yeah. because it's going to affect our brand and absolutely. if you know and the consumers are are the ones who are the most distrustful at this point absolutely Absolutely. And, you know, it's so interesting because, and I laugh too, because, I mean, not that it's funny, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's that like horrible, ha ha funny. <laughs> yeah, I understand. <laughs> exactly. But, you know, when you ask a lot of these, you know, supply chain companies, you know, what's your biggest issue? Their biggest issue really is siloed data, right? But they've got siloed data as they're remaining siloed themselves. And then, you know, it's like, well, you're never going to be able to fix silo data unless we actually fix, you know, these other issues that are surrounding it, such right. as- And they're like, that's not my job. Right. <laughs> it's not in my realm, right? <laughs> We're not going to invest in that. And so that's yeah. what, yeah, exactly. Yes. And so it's so interesting because what's really funny is I, I'm a very curious person, you know? I mean, I, I love the innovative field. I mean, this is why I love tech because I, I am one of those people that I love researching. I love analyzing. I love asking questions. I love digging to the, the core depths of what people really truly want. You know, what are their aspirations for the future? and getting them kind of outside of their, their inner world. So whether it's a, a high level exec or whether it's a company as a whole, you know, and, and, and taking a look at their mission and their future goals for their, you know, their enterprise or their division, I love that because I truly believe that when you can get down to the core of these issues, instead of placing band-aids, you know, on top of band-aid, that's where the change actually happens and can become sustainable, you know? And nothing, none of this change for supply chain 
is overnight at all. No, it's never going to yeah. be overnight. There's too many and, players involved. Yeah. But, you know, that brings me to my next question for you, which yeah. is really, you know, this is something we saw in the 3D print world. It was kind of the same way. It was like, well, we're not the filament manufacturer. Or we're not the, you know, or we're, we don't make the machine. We, do, we don't make the designs, you know, that's yeah. for up to the consumer. Well, and consumers aren't designers. So, oh, that's up to the CAD people. Like, you know, there's always that kind of passing the buck around blockchain, right? Like it's the yes. same thing, you know? So, so how do you think and what do you think is it going to really take to make blockchain, blockchain much more viable and much more applicable and able to sort of address these bigger problems? Yeah. I mean, I, my thing is that you, 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 and I hear this a lot in the industry, but I'm like, but you're still not doing it. <laughs> and, <laughs> I, I hear this too. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> and it's, you know, it, it's a top down, bottom up approach. And you've got to, you've got to start at the top with these, uh, with the, the major, uh, obviously the major players, uh, but also the, the top leaders. And it starts with getting the leadership on the same page. So before we start really expecting enterprises and and all these companies to start shelling out all of this money we need to, uh, you know on these products there needs to be a level of agreement between the leaders and if that agreement is not happening then there's still more work to be done yeah. right yeah. So, well, and I hear a lot of, a lot of times I hear, you know, something you mentioned earlier, which is that, oh, well, we're just waiting for consumer demand, but consumer demand isn't going to happen because this is based on a need, not on what they think they want. They don't right. know to ask for this yet. That's yes. what the problem with early innovation is. Absolutely. It's, Absolutely. It's a yeah. need, but not a want. And so, right. ha, you know, they're not going to get there if that's what they're waiting for. Oh, absolutely. And the thing is though, you know, you also do need that bottom up, um, you know, tactic because of that, because here's the thing, education is what is going to help us to build trust. So whether we're just talking about blockchain, all right, we need to understand on a global level, what blockchain is not just a select few. It's going to take time it's going to take resources and it's going to take money for everybody to play their part in education on what blockchain is, the benefits, and what the differences are between all these different types of blockchain that are out there. There's a lot of technical language going out there right now. And what's happening is people are segmenting themselves into groups and then they're bad mouthing the people that don't agree or ask challenging questions yeah you know this is it, it's it's truly the very same challenge that 3d printing ar vr like yeah. we see this pattern happen again and again with technology adoption yeah. and so i i call it bridge building that that's what's necessary yeah. is bridge building and so if we want to advance the technology we need to all collaborate and build the bridge from the old to the new we can't just say oh we're all here in the new and it's too bad for you people who don't aren't in the know you know yeah. You can catch up someday when it, you know, it, and it doesn't happen like that. Yes. There's somebody along the way will build a bridge. And when yes. they build a bridge, they make more money than everybody else. So I'm going to tell you that. And so if they can invest in it and do it all themselves, they make way more money. But there's no reason to not do that in a collaborative sense. And so I, I take it that that's a little bit what you're talking about when you're saying here, we need to humanize blockchain is that we need to, we need to make it something that is good for whatever, good for humans, good for this. And, yeah. you know, is that, is, am I understanding that right? Or are you really talking about getting more of us humans involved in the development of blockchain? Uh, it, it really is getting more people educated and on board. Um, and, and facilitating that process. So I love the term bridge, like you're saying. That's exactly what all of this is because 
honestly, I, I agree. Like if you're going to be the ones to really, truly stand out, make a difference and uh, lead the way into mass adoption, you're going to have the technology and that human touch. So you're going to encompass all of these skills. A great, uh, you're going to have a great product, great skilled developers who know what they're doing but you're going to really, really understand that there are consumers involved and that consumers do have a voice and that it is critical to educate these consumers who are a part, a, a very big part of supply chain. And, and let's not forget that, you know, we have, um, there, there's companies and value chains moving things but are there not people that are actually executing everything from start to finish uh, of the entire ecosystem? And when you can get those people understanding that they have a voice to say, to tell us what it is that they need, what would help, when that voice becomes loud enough and can start demanding that we, we create ethical brands. We, we force our clothing brands to validate that their clothing is not made in sweatshops. You know, that when they say organic, it really is organic. Imagine if we had a world that literally demanded that we know where our food comes from. Right. Imagine that. Wow. Imagine, imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that I'd instantly know what's not good in my fridge and exactly. be able to get rid of it before a kid eats it. <laughs> yes. Because honestly, the majority of the people don't even know right now that that is actually an option. Yeah. And yes, they, that's right? so true, right? Yeah, you I mean this is the thing is like we we don't have a concept of what's possible all the time. And yes. that is the job of us visionaries and us technologists and us innovators to make sure that they do know that these possibilities are out there and not only that they're out there, but that they can be molded and formed into something that can benefit them even more. Absolutely. And that's the biggest biggest takeaway of all of this is that this, this mission to be the, the bridge builders of the future is what's going to affect your bottom line. Yeah. It's what's going to not just, you know, gasp, help the environment <laughs> and help people, but it's, it's going to affect the bottom line of your business. It's going to help you save costs. It's going to help you bring in a, a larger profit. And it's going to help everybody, you know, in the supply chain together, working collaboratively, like you said. Yeah. So it, 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 to me, it feels like a win-win no-brainer. Right? Yeah, doesn't so, it? Does it? Right? But we yeah. know it's not that easy. <laughs> <laughs> we wish it was. So, so tell me a little bit about, before we go, what you're working on right now. I mean, obviously you're giving keynotes around the world. And so where, what else? I'm so excited. I, I really like, I just delivered this keynote in, in Athens, Greece and got such amazing feedback. And I got to say, I was a little nervous because, you know, here everybody is getting on stage. They're talking about the technology. And I'm like, I'm going to do things a little differently. <laughs> I'm going to talk but, about the people. <laughs> yes, exactly. But everyone loved it. And the feedback was incredible. So really what I'm doing now is I, I've, I'm turning it into, um, you know, and my official keynote, uh, I'm doing articles on it. I'm going to be doing video content on it. I'm actually developing a whole program around it and I want to pull in key people to help deliver this message because I can't do it alone. You know, that's, that's the thing. I can't do it alone and I don't want to do it alone because I do believe that the future of humanity is collaboration, you yeah. know, is equalizing 
uh, value <laughs> in Absolutely. the world. Yes, and we all have something to contribute. So I'm really, really excited, very passionate about just pulling key people in to really support this mission, knowing that it's going to affect all of us, you know? And um, so that's really big. I plan on doing, um, you know, even some uh, events, you know, travel events where I really get to showcase this on a bigger level. But in addition to that, I do also um, consult. Um, so I love, you know, I, I do love consulting. I do love uh, blockchain advisory. So I still do a lot of that, but um, I'm excited, you know, I'm excited to kind of be out there doing what I really believe in. I learned so much this year, uh, working with supply chain, working, you know, behind the scenes with the blockchain startup. But I, I truly found where my core value is for this space. And well, I really look forward to hearing what you're going to do and seeing yeah. how we can get this collaboration going. And that's kind of our mission here on the, at the New Trust Economy as well is to really start getting people from bickering about, you know, which coin is going to go and start <laughs> talking about, you know, how we're going to utilize this and how we're going to make it viable so that, you know, we can adopt blockchain into any company and make it understandable to the small businesses and uh, small enterprises who really could use to improve because the majority of the supply chain problems and the things we've been talking about are small to medium sized businesses and they don't have they don't have CTOs and they don't have the capacity to bring to invent a blockchain themselves so how can we bring things to them and how can you know the structure of it and the process of it and the rules of it work in favor of consumers, work in favor of those businesses so that they can adopt and they can do what they need and get that bridge. Yes, absolutely. I love it. I love it. We're so aligned. There's, there you go. <laughs> well, well, I hope you'll come back and talk to us again in the future. And we definitely want to ha hear how you're doing and, and where things are going. So please keep us posted. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being on the show today, Sherry. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who's listening. So I appreciate I appreciate this time. It's a very, very big message. Well, everyone, this is the New Trust Economy. You can find us at newtrusteconomy.com. And of course, you can find us everywhere on social media at New Trust Economy. Thanks so much for joining me. This is Tracy Hazard, and I'll be back again soon with another episode.